Uh, the thing, the thing that's tricky for me looking back on it is I'd had glandular fever badly, uh, sorry, quite badly, not compared to being hospitalized. It was the worst I've ever, I mean, I've had things like that sound worse, like bronchial pneumonia, but glandular fever was the worst I've ever had. It was real pink elephant stuff, you know, and you, you know, being delirious and you couldn't get anything down your throat apart from some dreadful stuff called Complan, I think it was. And I'd then gone straight into the group, pretty much, sorry, A-levels, and then straight into the group. And because I found it years later that you're supposed to you're supposed to be careful for about a year afterwards. You're supposed maybe two years. You're supposed to eat well, sleep well. Well, we did. I mean, Rich tried his best with all the looking after us with the food. But I mean, it was pretty basic fare. And um, you know, we were travelling up and down the country in the back of a bread band, dossing on floors. I mean, we literally we pitched up somewhere in Midlands, and we had nowhere to stay, too far to go back. And some guy said, "Well, I know a guy with a bloody big ass in Buxton," and we stayed on the drafted floor of a bloody big ass in Buxton. So I don't know to what degree it was, you know, physical stuff or whether it was tensional. The two just, but I eventually just sort of went kablonk really, and. Um, I've heard since that glandular fever can affect your nervous system, which I didn't know about. So you know, maybe no coincidence. But yeah, I mean, it did get um, it did get quite tense. Um, Fun enough, I heard um, Derek Jacobi recently. You're thinking, what's he talking about? I heard Derek Jacobi describe exactly the same thing that happened to me on one night on stage. He was describing just about to go on stage to do to be not to be which everyone knows well and he just apparently he had this thing where he just suddenly thought i don't know the, i don't know i don't know the words i can't remember how's it go and he found himself on stage saying it but not knowing how he was saying it sweating profusely and exactly the same thing happened to me i was at watford tech i remember playing the opening thing of let us know make love and i looked at the guitar and i thought i haven't got a clue not a clue what comes next and then I saw myself playing this thing, but it was really scary. It was really scary. And the trouble was that um, it wasn't the sort of thing you thought you could talk about. Years later, I've learned this is kind of de rigueur amongst actors. Loads of them have been through it. But at the time, it was just a very scary experience. Um, so, yeah, so I had a lot of that and it wasn't great, to be honest. It's sort of like having a panic attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But your mind just goes blank but you go onto autopilot which is what he was saying and he said he fought through it you know and uh, i tried fighting through it but i didn't make it at what point do you do you remember uh, at what point you, you just said look well well what happened was me no i never i didn't actually no i never i never lost it um but i got bronchial pneumonia as a result i sort of just went you know and of course i was off for a couple of weeks and doctors are saying this isn't good for you you should leave clearly this doesn't suit you and all the rest of it and i didn't you know and i just found my heart really wasn't in it after that really is the truth of it so um but we'd done the album which is the important thing so i mean i signed off at a at a you know i did my bit I did hold them up for a while, which is which is which is regrettable. But you know, and then obviously leaving when I when I held them up wasn't great. But I thought it was the right thing to do. If I hadn't left, they may never have got Phil Collins. So <laughs> Tony um, is saying that um, the point that he felt that you were almost the the leader of the band. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the ma a very important ad member in the music community, and that he felt at the point that you left, or you said you were going to leave, that that was probably it because you were so important to him. Mm, it's kind of him to say it. I think I think history has proved otherwise, but it was kind of him to say it. I think the mic had sort of subsumed a lot of 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 you know. I mean he. I wouldn't say you know it's simply my style, but uh, you know our style, our mutual style, had sort of he'd adopted a lot of that, and I think he was able to carry on uh, carry on a lot of that with Steve. Um, I mean, I was by no means an exceptional electric guitarist at all. Uh, I wasn't particularly original. I was reasonable, so uh, somebody else was always going to be um, able to do that. I think there, were, you know, there just were there were just enough very very clever people in that group, to be honest, to carry on in retrospect quite quite ably and I'm but I'm obviously very very nice attorneys to say that so at the time you didn't feel um, you weren't particularly aware obviously I mean you're going through this thing it must be a quite agonizing thing I'm gonna to have to 
to just leave it. You, <coughs> I'm sure you weren't thinking particularly of how it was affecting them or whether they would carry on. I mean, I, I imagine you thought it would just carry on without you. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I certainly didn't flatter myself by thinking, oh my God, I'm so important, they're going to pack up. I thought quite the reverse, to be honest. Um, I, you know, everyone seemed to be so, so strong, uh, really good at what they were doing, and very professional by that stage. Um, no, it never, never occurred to me they wouldn't carry on. Um, yeah. When well, in fact you were right. Absolutely. Was it a, a, a big relief once you decided you you weren't going to go on? That, and did the did it drop away and you started to feel okay? I'm not sure life is like that, is it really? Um, I mean, it was more a kind of this is I've got no choice, you know. I just I'm burnt out really. I don't really like having to do this, but I don't think I've got any choice. I didn't go out and celebrate. I didn't feel good about it. I just felt, and it felt a great feeling of relief. It was a kind of numbness, to be honest. I think it was probably quite depressed, is the truth of it, because, you know, I was probably the one who was the most keen on going on the road uh, initially. I mean, I'd been the one. I was the, you know, I was the driver in the original school group. You know, I was the one always being the dictatorial, tyrannical one, saying we must practice, we must practice. You know, when I arrived at Charterhouse, um, we'd had a group called League of Gentlemen who was sort of a jazz band, but, you know, I got straight in there with my mate Rivers and Rob Tyrrell, and then we got Mike Rutherford, and we had this group called Anon. You know, we were the kind of, um, you know, and I was, I was absolutely, you know, I was, I was completely obsessed by the whole thing. So... Um, I, you know, I was, like a lot of people, wanted to be, you know, I was a huge Beatles fan, huge fan, so the idea of being in that sort of thing myself was an absolute dream that's lasted from 13 up till 18. So the, I was, I was completely disillusioned. I was, um, relief, no, I, it was just a numbness. I don't know where I am now, but I know I've got no choice. I'm no good to these guys now. Um, and now I was a lost soul, definitely. Yeah. Getting a handle on Genesis, initially there's more acoustic, folky, but trying to push the envelope a bit on that. But then this influence of, you know, let's perform and let's try and excite an audience and let's try and expand and change from the, the, set, the small stuff is kind of pushing you. You know, I'm sure you're playing King, King Crimson and thinking, and the nice and thinking oh, come on well i think it's important i think those groups did definitely they definitely gave us the um idea about trying things that were were much more dynamic and much heavier and things that were well i mean i mean the stuff that's going on in the middle of the knife and looking for someone is a million miles away from what was on the previous album there's nothing like it um but it don't, i think luckily it's not too derivative you know, don't think people have listened to the knife and looking for someone said, oh yeah, mate, that's like, yes, or that's like, we were able to be, I think, I hope I'm not being sanctimonious, but I think we were able to be influenced by by the ideas, but not actually sound, you know, like a sound alike, and sort of copying note for note. There's going to be elements, there's always elements of people where you, you pick up a little riff or a motif or something, but I like to think that between us, we, we kept, it was quite a sort of natural development organic trespass I, I, I love trespass actually mm. I, I, I just feel that it's kind of a group of musicians who've kind of hit their stride in a way mm. but you're pushing the envelope you're, you're trying new things um it's 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 got a freshness about it and the the opening track looking for someone peter's voice is so kind of pure and like punches out doesn't it so to me, it's a very successful, kind of, in a way, first album. Well, that, I know it was the second. No, I think you've got to look at. I think it's fair enough to look at it like that. Actually, yeah. Are you, are you proud of that album? I think yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it was the first, as you say, of of a, a succession of albums which which took a particular course and took a particular style and developed. So, obviously, being part of that first one, yeah, I'm 
Very proud. I mean, looking for someone interesting again, you see, going back to the point about where the song kicked it off. It was very much early on, a kind of Stevie Winwood type song. Pete was quite influenced by Stevie Winwood. We all love Stevie Winwood. And so you've got, again, you've got that initial slight influence, just as you have the nice. But then the thing is hurtling off into a completely different direction. Um, and your point about the quiet song, which then suddenly, um, this, we were actually, I hadn't really thought about it quite that, we were really establishing a kind of template for a lot of their later material, which was not directly copying anybody. Peter's voice is obviously crucial in the sense, um, mm. you know, there's, a, there's this, the, the Genesis sound is beginning to, to develop in a way, the, the, the undertow, you might say, which, it, which is yourself. And, and Mike and, and, and Tony, and then Peter's voice coming coming on the top, adding this. Um, I mean, to, to, at that point, it seemed to me that you were a very crucial element in this, you yourself, as a part of the mix, very crucial. Did you see it like that, or were you already kind of thinking, mm, I don't know where we're, where we're heading and whether I'm part of it? Um. I don't think I, I think we were all just sort of in it together really I don't think any of us sort of sat around and thought well, I'm really important or I'm really not important or I don't belong here I think I think for John Mayhew I think it was difficult because John was an outsider and uh, he um, had a slight chip on his shoulder about various things he was a dear fellow I think it was difficult for him I don't think the rest of us um, sort of felt one way or the other really i mean the problems that i experienced later were to do with with just you know with with, with stage fright i mean it was nothing to do with the feeling i didn't belong or or did belong um i think we just we just were all going along on this voyage it's a little bit difficult for peter sometimes because when because he didn't have a an instrumental bass if you like um he was often slightly marginalized in the writing i mean looking for somebody who already had the the verse so that was fine that was all safe but when we go off developing the sections he didn't really have a, a, a power base you see because tony would be on the organ mike would be on bass i'd be on electric guitar or two 12 strings pete might pick up the flute but he'd often be slightly marginalized during that development process because he actually wasn't playing anything and didn't have any way of and he'd come up with ideas which were often very good but we often tended to slightly ignore him looking back on it which was probably wrong because Peter always had brilliant ideas but because it was just difficult for him to demonstrate because he didn't have an instrument um I mean it, it goes without saying it was the vocals and the lyrics were crucial um but what Peter would often, when the rest of us were developing the stuff, he'd go off and make the phone calls to the agents. I mean, he was very practical. He was the one that did all the dog, all the legwork. So he might appear to be somebody with his head in the clouds, you know, his lyrics, but he's nothing if not practical. He was the most practical one of us in that respect. So he, he in a sense, was pushing the band's future. Yeah, absolutely. Seeing the potential had the... He was. I think the rest of us were a bit more naive uh, in terms of um, you know, the music will out. He knew the music wouldn't out. He had to be bloody well get on the phone and get get gigs and hassle away at it. And uh, um, but uh, as I was saying, I mean, he, he was given the space to do that because the fact the rest of us were developing. And I think sometimes he would come back into the song and maybe feel a little bit left out. Um, um, and perhaps had to go along with sections which he maybe wasn't necessarily completely sure about. Um, and he always had ideas that were sort of ahead of their time, really, on arrangement, which the rest of us didn't really listen to often. And uh, looking back at it, I think he probably was right, actually. So it's interesting what you're saying, because it sounds as though he might have experienced some frustration quite early on. I think he did. I think he did actually, and he wasn't a pushy guy at all, um, and he couldn't de he couldn't really demonstrate it. That's the problem because there wasn't somebody to demonstrate it on. Uh, hmm. If you were to um, kind of briefly encapsulate the different qualities of, of the of the band at that point, I mean, what would you say? I and mean, what would you say about say Tony uh, first? Well, in terms of the mix of the group, um, I mean, Tony was immensely talented, um, very, very creative, um, very strong personality. Um, Mike 
again a tremendous talent which sort of emerged during that phase was more mike would be more um kind of relaxed and diplomatic when it got to sort of bartering it was a difficult business if you've got four composers with no set template it's not just verse chorus which verse is better which chorus is better somebody would say well let's go off down that route and somebody would say well i think we should go off down that route and it's uncharted territory who's to say which is right or wrong um and it you know they, it could get difficult at times because there's no right or wrong um so there would inevitably be certain you know there would be disagreements there had to be i mean just four people writing together is not a natural process um uh, and Mike was very diplomatic. Pete could be very stubborn, but he would just back off. But Tony, was, Tony had a very strong will, and he was very good. So um, he and I were probably the two that sort of, you know, kind of <laughs> went most of the way there, if you like. Um, but I would tend to back off as well. Um, he was the better musician as well. So, um, but it worked, you know, it worked, and. Um, I think where we were foolish was naive, was living in the same place together for a long period of time. You know, anybody will tell you that if you live and work together all the time, it's, 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 of course it's going to lead to frustration. And um, we, you know, the guys never saw their girlfriends half the time. It was positively draconian. Um, and, you know, it was all the sort of, it was in the, it was in the, in the, wake of all the let's get it together in the country cottage stuff you know all the hippie kind of stuff and you know we knew that the traffic had done that and uh and uh, but we were too serious we never went for walks we weren't the sort of group to go down the pub and have pints and you know relax and kind of maybe at the end of the day where there had been a few arguments just kind of you know rub rub put a bomb on the on the thing and it all got a bit tense i think it wasn't really helped also by the fact that we were eventually just doing the, exactly the same set every night so there was no new music to kind of give you a bit of um excitement a feeling of going forward it was it got very treadmill like um same stuff traveling in the back of the bread van no windows and people started arguing and it's kind of inevitable looking back at it we were too young to know the difference but but anyway you know we 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 got there we kept going until the end of that um phase uh, it's like a school year really i suppose and we're looking back at it you know started in september and in june we got picked up by by charisma so we made it we did all these um i used to find them really hairy we did all these showcase gigs and ronnie's upstairs at ronnie scott's which is great fun because we used to have, have to carry the organ up about a thousand steps and back. We had no, we had no road. I mean, we had mates working as roadies, but we, there was no do that. You know, we were all in it together. So there was no question of hanging around afterwards and having supper with people as well. People have often asked about this, you know, because we played with Nick Drake quite a lot. And, you know, how do you, you know, do you go to the pub and Nick? Do you have supper? No, 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 no. We finished the gig. Stuff had to go back into the van. Off we went back home again um so you know it was it was pretty serious stuff it was probably too serious actually looking back and i remember finding it all starting to get terribly tense and i used to get me very frightened towards the end because i remember thinking oh this is too serious too serious too serious and all these agents were coming and watching our showcase gigs in london it was like god if we screw up you know oh god i, f I definitely got very freaked by it towards the end it was too intense it's a funny the the this, the question about do you regret leaving genesis is one i've been asked so many times and, and of course the honest answer is that i didn't have any choice i wasn't i you know it was no good for them and it was no good for me so i don't think regrets are really in it if i'd walked out in a state of high dudgeon through musical differences in a particular in, in a totally healthy state then of course i'm i'm an effing idiot but um and i should have regrets but simply regrets are, are neither here nor there it was the only course of action that was available um so um waste of time really um and anyway, as I said, they got Phil Collins, so it all worked out pretty well. No, I mean, there's no point in thinking like that. I do remember playing in a game of cricket, actually, once, and going out to bat with this nice chap, but he's rather on my saying, So we're back going out to open the batting, he tells me, tell me, Ant, did you regret it? And I was thinking, what's he talking about? How does he know I haven't got a box on? And of course, he's talking about leaving Genesis. So I get asked this question at the most bizarre places and the most bizarre times. I can't remember what I said to him, but I think I just... <laughs>
I mean, I, I don't have any regrets about leaving because it was inevitable given what was going on. But if you if you then said to me, would I like to have been part of some of the music that they did later on? Absolutely. I mean, who wouldn't? You know, selling them by the pound and stuff like that. I would love to have been involved in stuff like that. And, um, I, of course, I'm always going to wonder what, what would have happened if I'd, you know, uh, if I'd carried on and what influence could, could I have had and the stuff I'd been part of. But then... Um, you know, the Lord giveth with one hand and taketh away with the other. I, I was a very narrow musician at the time, and um, I, I studied and learnt um, and acquired many more skills and stuff after that. So whilst I, I still would love to have been part of their music, if I'd stayed, I would probably have remained, in some respects, I think, quite a narrow musician, whatever I achieved. So, you know, you win some, you lose some, really. And it seems to me that um, being on the road, that, that that first period of being on the road, did not appeal to you at all as a lifestyle. As a, as a, uh, and that probably these huge tours of these massive stadium shows would actually just not have been you either. I mean, I, think I don't know, really. It's this bizarre thing, you see, because I was the showman. Pete acquired a showmanship by acting. Because as you probably know, he was phenomenally nervous to start with on, not stage fright as such, you know, the crippling stuff, but just natural, very, ner very nervous. So the point he would never remember the lyrics. I mean, it was hopeless. People were, you know, couldn't do the announcements. Richard was going to have to go to makeup. And I don't know if you know this story, but the big joke is that because we spent so long tuning the twelve strings, which were always going out of tune on these cold clubs, somebody had to do something. So Pete started telling stories. So he started acting, he got outside himself. Once he got outside himself, um, he was fine. It was not him, it was an act. And like a lot of actors are very shy people. Um, so that, you see, that worked, that worked very, very well for him. Um, hmm. I can't remember the point, so what, what was well, the point? It's because you, you just said that, uh, but you were the showman. So that's right. Yeah, well, I mean, I was, I was, you know, I loved the early school group stuff. You know, I loved, you know, Richard, Richard McFell was Mick Jagger and I was Keith Richard and I used to love prancing about it. I wasn't, I, you know, I used to like all that. I wasn't, I didn't feel shy about being on stage at all. No, I got hit by, I got hit by a sledgehammer that crept up on me later. But um, no, I liked all that. I'd have liked all the adulation. And the group is no, I'm joking. But because we never had any of that, it was far too early for any of that, and we were far too sort of cerebral a group as well. I um, mean, we got taken around to Mott the Hoople's place, and they were so sweet with us. But we were like, you know, we were kids. We didn't know what was going on. There were women in every room, and they were probably their wives. Okay, I don't know. I don't want to cause any cause any aspersions, but they're really sweet. To us. Our eyes are popping out of our heads, you know. Well, I was there at the wrong time. Oh, Damn it! Oh dear. <laughs> No, uh, no sex, drugs, and rock and roll. No, none of it. No. <laughs> it might have been. What, what did you make of Genesis's progress? I mean, the the arc of their career through th through um, Lamb and then Peter leaving. Did, did it surprise you that Peter left? No, I don't think so. I mean, I followed them a lot after that early on. Um, and um, I suppose I did feel a bit guilty because they didn't get another guitarist to start when the poor old Tony was playing some of my part. Suddenly did his technique a lot of good, but it must have driven him crazy. And um, I got to know Phil quite well, who was just, you know, so friendly and so... And, um, you know, he worked so well with Mike. It was just brilliant. Um but these were the same kind of gigs, you know, once it started to get very, you know, these huge, daunting, big places, then I began to feel it was something I really couldn't cope with. I didn't particularly like that kind of thing anyway. So I probably from about maybe 73, 74, by the lamb, I probably didn't watch them much then. Um, I didn't know about the, um, you know, I've, I've learned, I've heard since film and, both Steve said about all the terrible arguments that used to go on. I didn't know about that. I sort of saw Mike a fair amount, but he obviously wouldn't tell me about that. I just think it's inevitable in a group where you've got everyone composing like that, there's going to be disagreements. Everybody wants their slice of the cake. And more to the point, these, these, these chaps are all developing now their own innate style. 
and they have a vision. And clearly Peter must have felt more and more, I think, that, that, that his vision was being compromised. And, you know, one-fifth of the cake was a fragmentation of what he saw. Um, I don't know to what extent it was a, any particular personality clashes. I just think it's inevitable that you can't have that many writers in the... I mean, it's no coincidence it ended up with three. I mean, that's tough. But, you know, four or five is just it's heavily, heavily weights it. Um, so... Um, probably a little bit surprised at the time but but quite quickly not surprised i think um peter's um so it's almost uh, you know we talked about the sort of figurehead uh, apparently to the public maybe seen as the leader mm. um through that period with his theatricality and mm. his presentation um so to many people in the public um, especially the music journalists. Of course. You know, Peter's leaving seemed like, okay, that's it, Genesis is over, folks. Mm. Um, but then. Extraordinary. I know, quite extraordinary. Um, I mean, everyone knew that Phil could sing. Um, I mean, ironically, he sang a couple of songs on my first solo album before he became their lead singer. By the time it came out, it was a couple of a year or two later. I got I got stick for cashing in on the Genesis lead singer, which just goes to show how wrong the press can be. Much as I love them, um, but um, I'm sure you know the story. They auditioned. It wasn't it wasn't a, a, a you know a sort of a shoe in, and I don't think he necessarily wanted to do both. But they couldn't find anybody else that they felt. Um, you see, he'd also he could incorporate a lot of Gabrielisms as well, you see. So he could sing the early stuff, and that was the thing. He used to sing well with, with, with Peter. So that was vital. So both from the point of view of, of, taking, of carrying the old legacy on and also the talent that he had for the new stuff, nobody else could come close, really. Um, again, with the benefit of hindsight, it looks very sensible, but it must have been seemed pretty daunting at the time get another drummer what's the other drummer going to be like and all that kind of stuff is that really practical and when your groups were doing that um a guy that had been the drummer suddenly coming out and fronting it i mean i'm trying to think if any have done it they've been singing drummers but not ones that i don't know are there any others i'm not sure but um so yeah no they did incredibly well um, incredibly well um and phil was obviously such a phenomenal find in every way i think as a person i think he was incredibly important to the group because he was that kind of jack the lad good vibes um positive happy go lucky i know there are aspects later in his life he's not like that but that was basically him and um john mayhew much as i i loved him and respected him was much more uptight and, and sort of nervous and actually i think if the drummer's like that it can affect the rest of the group. I think Phil's personality, as much as his musicality, made an enormous difference because also his looseness and lightness must have helped to break down some of the kind of slightly more middle class, you know, tension and all the rest of it. Um, so it was, you know, he was a sort of a, a triple genius find from all those three points of view, if you like. Were you still um, a sort of Genesis fan in the eighties? Um, I think as they got more more um, mainstream commercial, I I probably didn't think it was as original as before. I mean, I for me the high watermark would be selling in above the pound. I think um, I like a lot of the later stuff, but when once it started getting very um, much more mainstream pop. I just thought they were nice pop songs, but it wasn't it wasn't sort of seminal anymore to me. Um, but also remember, I'd studied in the meantime. I'd ch I, you know, this is this is very subjective because I'd studied classical music, and I'd kind of gone through a whole road to Damascus thing with that, and then was moving into TV and film music, which was becoming a lot of my favourite stuff. So a lot of rock and pop music was not meaning a huge amount to me by the mid '80s, really. You know, I was you know, grown up, I suppose, in the respect, and I. They were appealing to a, a, a kind of more poppy audience, and um, it was good stuff. But it was never going to mean the same to me as the as the earlier stuff had done. Um. 
Mike's book. Which oh, yeah. Out, has, to some extent, sort of lifted a little bit of the curtain. Mm. And, and, you know, he's, he drops things in, which are a little surprising in a way. Mm. Now, it's, it surprised me. I mean, I thought, oh, mm. this is all wrapped up. Yeah. Um, we're, you know, we're not... We're, we're not going to be taken into this this room, and then Mike sort of drops in. Well, you know, I first started taking uh, cocaine just to keep keep away. That sort of thing was kind of uh, interesting, but I, I wondered whether he realised just just where he was leading us when he started opening those mm. particular sort of chapters and those doors. Any any thoughts on that? What, what did you think? Well, I haven't read the whole book, to be honest. Um, you know the story already that I got a little bit surprised by early on in the book where he talks about his housemaster, who really was a truly frightening man, and, and it, he was, you know, very, very sadistic. Um, and then polarises myself as having an easy time with my housemaster because I was good at cricket. Now, yeah, as I said, a lot of my friends would be very surprised about that because I didn't play it. It was deeply unfashionable at that time. We used to fix the games so we could go off and, you know, the sort of compulsory house games, so we could go off and practice, smoke or swim. And in fact, I remember Peter Gabriel being a complete stick in the mud once and stick in there and somebody had a knocky stump over and said, come on, get off, you know, we're going to finish this game. So I emailed Mike saying, I'm looking forward to reading on to find out what else I'm good at but uh, um, I was actually quite a good footballer but so I, that rather kind of once it put me off but I just remember thinking Mike your memories is is I'm not sure what, what am I reading here <laughs> actually so so I may I may plow on with it but um, I, I loved the early stuff about his parents I found that really because his parents were absolutely lovely I found that very interesting but I I mean Mike as far as re uh, uh, revelations about drugs I mean let's face it it's a business that's riven with it a lot of the entertainment is, industry is and um i actually didn't know that i had a suspicion of it um but um genesis is a pretty clean group compared to most so i don't think it's a, a problem it would be probably expected yeah it's not yeah, really yeah. surprising no no no, no no there was a little bit of marijuana there was a little bit of marijuana went on not much teeny bits um and um but um peter gable was very anti-drugs People used to be convinced that he wrote he wrote songs under the influence of drugs. Peter actually at one stage was so Puritan that he thought anything written under under the influence of drugs was invalid. I don't mind saying that because that's what he said. Um, yeah, there was a Puritan edge to the group. Remember, at a public school, we'd liked all the hymns and stuff. So um, yeah, but it, was, you you were. It sounds to me like as though you you were very kind of tough on yourself. You were, wanted to be very disciplined your Christmas cottage period you're like oh, yeah. we get up and we work from 10 till 6 and yeah. you know we want this thing to be um, a band that's kind of going somewhere and we can't go somewhere if we start going to the pub and, you know. yeah and, and also I think a critical point which I hadn't thought about mentioning was that you see um, Tony was taking a year off university for this and the rest of us were due to go to university the following year so if we were going to make it had to get on with it so uh, that was another spur to actually do it quickly and then in the process probably overwork and some of the problems that came with it but there was a cogent reason for, for doing that um, hmm. before we cut just um, reviewing what you've how, how what you said and hmm. so on. is there anything there that you kind of wanted to add to where you thought oh, it's something I, something I should have said here, but I didn't say it. No, I think it's fine to just be a little bit worried about what I said about Mott the Hoople. That was not. <laughs> it's, it's widely known. Oh, is it? Mott the Hoople would be the first to, oh, uh, okay. to tell that. But um, probably what isn't widely known is that they were huge. We played with them at the Kingston Hotel, and they were so kind to us. They were big fans of us, right early on, in our duffel coats. And they asked us over to their place, and they were, they were really lovely. Um, with the Shropshire accents. <laughs> I think there's a great BBC4, not the Hoople documentary, where it all came out. Oh, really? It was all admitted to and nothing was hidden. Ah, no, they were lovely. Any, anything to add? Um, not really, no. Been fun talking about it. Great. Been terrific listening. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. You're still awake? Cool, yeah. Good. Ready for like a cup of tea now?